All right, here we go. Uh, our first performer tonight is Lisa Frias in Project Room 31. This evolving work explores Lisa's 21 and continuing years in the classroom, the blessings, honesty, heartbreak, miracles, and hilarious as hell middle school moments that happen in Room 31. Please welcome Lisa Frias. We just go, 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 find the honey in the water in the well. We just go, 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 find the honey in the water in the well. Sky palm cracked and all the birds fell. Angels help in charity to ring the big bell. Our hearts are big and our promises long. Sweeping up the dirt as we're carrying on. Okay, Dougie's warm up time. Make sure you can see yourself in the mirror. Here we go. Feet parallel, shoulder width apart. You want to keep your knees soft and not rigid. Now bend and straighten. Right foot out, bend and straighten. Right foot front, bend and straighten. Right foot back, bend and straighten. Right foot center, bend and straighten. Left foot out, bend and straighten. Excellent. Left foot front. Bend and straighten, left foot back. Bend and straighten, left foot right next to your right foot. Sweeping up the dirt as we're carrying on. Go ahead and turn out from the hip, knees over the toes. One long line from hip to heel. Step out with that right foot, knees over the toes. Abs engaged, back straight. Look in the mirror and love what you see. Teachers say some really bizarre stuff to kids. Some of it is really serious and damaging because it's racist or homophobic or authoritarian or shaming. Some of it is just weird. I had this elementary PE teacher who used to make us first graders run in the snow in our little white kids sneakers all winter long with no jackets. She also had this obsession about warning girls about the dangers of sucking on the ends of their braids. She'd give us his repeated long explanations about it and uh, cite all these numerous instances where girls would have to have their stomachs pumped because of the big hairballs that accumulated. <laughs> she gave us this lecture about once a week at least. I mean, how much fucking hair do you have to ingest to end up with a humongous hairball in your stomach? I always imagined it was the size of a basketball, maybe because she was the PE teacher. All I know is her lectures only serve to make us suck on our hair that much more out of curiosity, <laughs> or maybe a perverse desire to actually get hairball sick and subsequently have to have our stomachs pumped and not have to run laps in the New England snow and ice in the middle of February. She was very stern. She always wore culottes. I guess now they call them scorts. <laughs> One day, I'm taking attendance in advisory, and I look down and see a big bulge on the left side of my leg. To make a long story short, a pair of dirty underwear, with a hole in it, mind you, suddenly falls out the leg of my coveralls and lands on the classroom floor. <laughs> a pair of dirty underwear. The teacher's dirty underwear that somehow got stuck in the leg of my not dirty and very cute coveralls is lying on the classroom floor. <laughs> okay, I left something. The bell had already rung. The kids had already gone to their next class. But holy shit, that was a close call. I am a popular teacher, but nobody could live that down. <laughs> Go ahead and arc that left arm to the right, keeping your torso facing forward, knees over your toes. You want that arm next to your ear, not in front of or behind your head. Keep your legs straight and maintain that turned out position. Go ahead and rotate the upper body into a turn, into a flat back. You're gonna have to stick your butt out a little bit to keep your back flat. I know that sounds funny. He, he, he. <laughs> Gaze to the floor, arm next to your ear. And duckies, we are still in turned out position. Don't move your feet. Imagine that you're trying to balance a glass of milk on your back. That's how flat you want it to be. Go ahead and drop to the ankle, chest to the thigh. Oh, it feels good. Come to center, hang there for a little bit, bend the knees and roll up. Take a full count of eight. 
and we are looking at ourselves once again. I went to school with extremely wealthy kids who never missed an opportunity to make fun of my discounted jeans from Kmart or the fact that I'd worn them two or three times that week already. These were kids who, when they got to high school, were gifted brand new Audis when they learned to drive. And despite the fact that behind their gilded front doors, I'm sure their own versions of family trauma were playing out, that constant cloak of wealth served to create a deception the rest of us had no access to. Our shit was bare and loud and odd. Theirs was quiet and concealed and tight. During this time, I was deep in the throes of my eating disorders and starting to experiment with substances. I was wildly insecure and hadn't dealt with my sexual abuse yet. <laughs> Let's just say I was not a poster child for self-esteem. I remember this pair of pants I had called elephant pants because the legs were really wide, like elephant legs, presumably. They had huge horizontal stripes and garishly bold colors, which much to my dismay served to make my big thighs appear even bigger. Like the jeans, I wore them way too much, which should not go unnoticed by my spoiled peers. This was a really rough period of time for my mom. So some of the usual mom stuff, like buying me clothes, didn't happen. It was during this time, however, that I discovered something about myself that would prove to be the key to my survival in middle school and for years to come. I was funny. The revelation occurred in Mr. Scaduto's music class. He had one of those little record players who lived in the beige-like suitcase thing that he would unlatch and take out every day. Mr. Scaduto, he was cool. He had sideburns and wore turtlenecks. He had beige polyester flared pants too that somehow looked righteous on him. All week he'd been playing Beatles songs as part of our lessons. I, as usual, was sitting in the back trying to be invisible or somehow fit in with these elitist meanies. When suddenly in response to what he was saying, I blurted out a very witty comment. Mr. Scaduto said, oh man, I forgot to bring the quiz I told you about yesterday. And I said, all my troubles seem so far away. <laughs> Car crash could not have elicited a more startled response from my classmates. Every single head in front of me whipped around to see where the comment had come from. Who said that? One of them implored. I froze in my seat, sweat pooling under my always sweaty armpits and running like a river to the waistband of my elephant circus tent pants. <laughs> As I smiled sheepishly and raised my hand, something miraculous happened. The room erupted in laughter. And it wasn't the usual at me kind of laughter that I was so familiar with. It was the, wow, you secretly funny person. We actually approve of you in this moment kind of laughter. Good one, somebody said. A few more delayed chuckles filled the room. Even Mr. Scaduto was laughing. I could never compete with the shiny popularity and wealth of these kids, but I could, upon occasion, make them laugh. And this, my friends, saved my ass. <laughs> During the pandemic and distance learning, I was teaching from home. I gave an assignment on the legendary Alvin Ailey, but I forgot to check the settings of the Google Doc with the questions. Instead of the private make a copy for each student, I accidentally posted it giving all students at editing capacity. And once a student typed on the doc, all the other students could see their answers. For this assignment, they had to answer questions about Ailey's most revered work, Revelations. One question asked, what type of music did Alvin Ailey use in Revelations? The answer I was looking for was African-American spirituals, blues, and gospel music. This one student answered like this, however. The type of music Alvin Ailey used in Revelations was, are you ready? Jazzy Catholic jazz. <laughs> Jazzy Catholic jazz. What? Jazzy Catholic jazz. Jazzy Catholic jazz student was the first to answer. So because I messed up the settings, Everyone else saw her answers before I realized my mistake. Out of a hundred or so students, I'd say a good half to two thirds submitted jazzy Catholic jazz <laughs> as the musical choice of the legendary and the iconic Alvin Ailey. Yeah. <laughs> 
Lunge series, go ahead and bring that right leg all the way back into a really nice lunge. Remember, the closer your knee is to the floor, the better the lunge. Remember, you have to keep that front foot on the floor. Don't lift your heel. Your front leg should look like an upside down letter L. That's how you know you're doing it correctly. L for Lisa, go ahead and reach that left hand up to the ceiling and look at it, reach, reach, reach for the stars. Bring it to the front, to the inside of that left foot and tuck it around back like this. Excellent duckies. Go ahead and straighten both legs, chest to the thigh. Bring that right foot center and bend and straighten. Slide that left foot back and repeat everything we just did with the right leg. Lunge, lunge, lunge. And reach. Did I accidentally say fuck before? Oh my God. Is that why everybody was snickering? No, no, no. They wouldn't let me know, would they? I think they would let me know. Did I say fuck before? I don't remember. Oh my God. Maybe I did. But no, I think they would let me know. Would they let me know? I hope they would. And your head is the last thing to come up. Butterflies, they struggle too. <laughs> I started doing meditations once a week on Mindful Mondays. At first I was worried the kids wouldn't be into it or think it was really weird. Not only did they grow to love it, they let me know how much they really needed it. They are masters at showing up some really crazy shit, despite some really crazy shit going on in their lives. The opportunity to hit pause and focus on self-care, <coughs> really important for all of us, right? During one meditation, I closed my own eyes as I instructed the students to place your hand on your tongue so you can feel the rise and fall of each inhale and exhale. I gave a few more instructions, a bunch of affirmations, and had them continue their mindful breathing a little while longer. When I opened my eyes and before I guided them to the end of the session, I was shocked to see almost all of the class with their mouth slightly open and one hand holding onto their oh, tongues. Their tongues. They didn't hear tongue for tummy. They heard <laughs> tongues. Oh my God, they look so ridiculous. <laughs> when they opened their eyes, we all had a good laugh about it. They said they thought it was weird, but you know, went along with it anyways. <laughs> I had a few teachers who desperately wanted to be seen as cool. You know, Mr. Scudo, Scududo kind of cool. My seventh grade math teacher, Mr. Schreiner, not so cool. He would have his back to us as he was writing on the chalkboard. He'd be lecturing and feverishly writing, chalk cooking on the chalkboard, click, 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 chalk dust flying off his hand, his body moving side to side as he wrote. After he finished whatever explanation he was frenetically giving, he would turn around to face us and he would have chalk all over himself, <laughs> all down the front of his pants, all down the front of his shirt. And here's the thing that would really have everybody losing it. He had chalk all over his face, <laughs> all over his lips, his eyelids, his eyelashes, his nose, his forehead. It was as if the dude did a swan dive into a pool full of chalk. It was crazy and it happened regularly. He didn't know why everybody was laughing. Nobody told him. And then he would get really mad at us and yell, which of course was even funnier. This chalk covered madman screaming at us like a maniac. I know since being funny was my only middle school attribute, I dropped a few good one-liners about old Mr. Chalk Man. One day in first grade, my teacher brought a mattress to the classroom, a full-size mattress, but she plumped down in the middle of the floor toward the front. Everybody stared at it, not knowing what she was doing. She then walked over to this student, Omar, took his hand, made him stand up, and dragged him to the mattress. She said, since you can't stop wetting your pants, Omar, you can lie down here like a baby. Omar started crying hysterically, trying to pull away. I think a bunch of us were crying too. We were only six. It was horrible. She pushed him onto the mattress. He was sobbing uncontrollably and jerking his body all around. She continued to push him down and berate him until she got tired of traumatizing him and pulled him up and out the door to the principal's office. Omar was one of only a few Latino kids in the class. She completely humiliated him. Roll shoulders back, 
as you walk forward. Roll shoulders forward as you walk back. One, two, three, tap, four, five, six, seven, tap, eight. Four steps forward. Four steps back. Welcome to the deep end of the pool. So why duckies? I don't know why exactly. All I know is at the beginning of my teaching career, I started calling my kids duckies and they started calling me mama duck and bringing me rubber ducks. <laughs> and for 21 years in county, it is stuck. Thank God, we all like it. <laughs> this is for the duckies who hide in the bathroom. This is for the students who never get in trouble, but need attention too. This is for the kid whose shoes are too small. This is for the duckies who don't look forward to school vacations. This is for the students who really, really try This is for the duckies who always eat lunch alone. This is for the kid who thinks they're fat and ugly and stupid. This is for the kid no one realizes is hilarious. <laughs> this is for the student who pulled the train last night and comes to school drunk. This is for the kid who courageously comes out to their family. This is for the duckies who say hi to you five or six times a day. <laughs> this is for the kid who doesn't use deodorant. Yeah. This is for the students who make a big, beautiful choreography for you after your dad dies. This is for the kids who say, I love you to their friends and really mean it. This is for the duckies who don't live to see graduation. This is for the kids we can't ever forget. We just go, 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 find the honey in the water in the well. We just go, 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 find the honey in the water in the well. Sky poem cracked and all the birds fell. Angels help in charity to ring the big bell. Our hearts are big and our promises long. Sweeping up the dirt as we're carrying on. I remember this one time when I was a pretty new teacher. I was way too harsh on this kid named TJ. I scolded him in front of the whole class. It was just way too harsh. He was talking constantly while I was trying to teach. I just blew up and screamed at him. Not reacting to this kid was an everyday thing. He was pretty charming and really bright, but always, always pushing the limit. He drove me crazy, honestly. Mm -hmm. Still, I was way too harsh with him. I could have taken him out in the hallway and, you know, checked in with him and apologized, but I didn't. I knew that since I humiliated him publicly, I needed to apologize publicly. So I did. I'll never forget the confused look on his face that melted into a smile. I think his chest even popped out a little bit too. 
It's all good, Mama Duck, he said. And you know, that moment, it was a game changer for both of us. He was always teacher's helper after that, trying hard most of the time, even catching his behavior when it got funky. And that's been my policy ever since. I'm strict. I'm very loving. And I try to apologize when I fuck up. Don't try and count the feathers on your wings. It just might slow you down. Like a fear or a fog or an uninspired lyric to deceive you in the smoke. You've got to keep going anyway. Perched on the lip of everything you hope for and everything they dreamt of. The soil beneath the floor that's underneath your toes. The yesterday behind the morning of today, it comes in again. Bright and blinding custard, a lemony truth against the sky, and you know you are awake. Butterflies, they struggle too. And you are exactly who you need to be in this moment, duckies. Don't try and count the feathers on your wings. It just might slow you down. Cradle a bowl instead to catch the floating bubbles or the prayers of fragrant gardens. The imprint of those weird drawings in your journal books. There is wind inside your breath, ancient and contemporary. I love breathing, so do you. It's hard as hell still. Don't try and count the feathers on your wings. It just might slow you down. And we need you here, duckies. We really need you. Oh, that's a teacher. Lisa, bring out the environment. And as they say, now for something completely different. Uh, our second performer tonight is Albert Alexander in Popov Vodka. In this piece, Albert reviews the cheapest vodka in America, told to the story of some young, drunk college boys facing their mortality. Please welcome Albert Alexander. Pop up vodka. <clears throat> It is the death wish incarnate. Look into a bottle and you'll see emptiness. Taste it and you are tempting oblivion. The scent is a warning. Taste confirmation of that warning. A warning that this stuff is bad. And that late, grim shadow of the Kremlin gazing out demonically behind a red square, the all white, all caps label, that the cap, the bottle and its contents all plain to the point of disrespect. There's not the slightest shred of luxury, dignity, or even pleasure in pop up. And it is not a drink you want to be seen with. It's the type of thing you buy exclusively under duress, usually late at night 
from a corner store you didn't plan on going to, taking it home in a paper bag to finish in private, and then to leave the empty, buried under a layer of trash. And in college, that's what we drank. I went to a party school, Michigan State University. Sports Illustrated puts out a list each year of the top party schools, all ranked. My school is not on that list. Sports Illustrated, in their words, said to include a professional among amateurs would be unfair. <laughs> and I lived on an honors dorm, which doesn't mean it was cleaner or safer. And there were three kids on that dorm floor business majors, financially inclined, that did the math for the rest of us in at least one respect. They helped us determine that if you either don't or can't afford to care about flavor, quality, brand, or anything other than cost, there was only one thing to drink. At 41 cents per shot. Oh. Popov is the rational choice. <laughs> I don't remember what I first got drunk on, but it might as well have been Popov. It was almost certainly vodka. I was going to check out this guy. He said he was good at guitar. I was trying to put together a group for a show. So I was auditioning. And after the audition, he asked me if I wanted to do shots and watch the OC. I'd never done either of those things. So I said, sure. I still don't remember doing either of those things. <laughs> I do remember attempting badly to do flips in various hallways um, and dizzy and confused spotting faces that would later recognize me and I would politely smile and not recognize them. And I especially remember the frustration of trying to make my fingertips touch, knowing this was somehow related to a sobriety test and being fascinated and frustrated, the loss of fine motor control. I remember those parts, but the rest of the night is lost. Many nights were lost to pop off vodka. And I remember a boy who had celiac, but drank beer anyway, lots of it. And every weekend, he was taking millimeters off his colon that would not grow back. He didn't like talking about it, but he did like drinking. There was a different boy, I remember, who lived with my friend. This guy was hooked on muscle relaxers. Sometimes we would come home to this dorm and see him sprawled out on the floor, drooling, insensate, and we'd have to help him pull him up into his bed because he couldn't move on his own. There was another boy I remember who lived on my floor who took a whole bunch of a lot of different stuff. Definitely some psychedelics, probably some things of questionable provenance, and just kind of went out of his head. Uh, started out with him screaming in a stairwell. Then he ran outside into the Michigan winter without a coat. And we couldn't find him. He got picked up by paramedics, did a couple weeks in a rehab, and came back changed. He used to dream of being the senator from Alaska, but that dream died that night. All these boys were pop up. I remember a year where I participated in an annual ritual where tons of kids would gather at the Cedar Village apartments every time our basketball team did or did not make the final four. The purpose of this ritual was to stand around and see if the mob would become a riot. And in this case, it did not. Nobody threw a bottle at a cop. No outsiders came in to start shit. So we all just kind of stood around. And it was normal drunken kid milling until I heard a crunch overhead. I looked up in the fourth floor balcony, the cheaply built Cedar Village apartments had collapsed. There was one girl 
on that balcony who'd fallen through the floor. She landed, thank God, on the balcony below, but it didn't look like a good fall. I didn't see her get up. The entire crowd went silent. And in that hush, one boy yelled, no fat chicks. That boy was Papa. I remember the year where there was a riot. Just one too many couches set on fire, I guess. And the cops on horses decided it was time to step in. So they went up and down Fraternity Row, armed with their automatic rifles and dogs. Um, and they shot tear gas through all the windows in all these fraternities. Still outlawed by the Geneva Convention. And that tear gas filled all these buildings and caused children to scream and cry and vomit, spill out into the street, some of them getting swept up, taken to the drunk bin where an average of $5,000 for a minor in possession and a loss of license is pretty common. Uh, but this is how you control a crowd. So they pushed all those students towards the center of campus. At the same time, down in South Complex, all the athletes and the folks who like to hang out with athletes were also having too much fun. So folks launched tear gas into all those various complexes and drove those students towards the center of campus. You might imagine two colliding groups of panicked teens is a little bit challenging to control. So the cops hit them with a group of tear gas. The uh, whole place was blanket. Now, I didn't know any of this because I was hanging out in my girlfriend's basement dorm. We don't really follow sports. And the first sign to us was when our eyes got itchy and then our noses started to run. And then we started to notice a heavy, dense fog settling in the room, probably leaking through these hundred year old windows. We got pretty concerned, ran upstairs and out looking for fresh air where we then found huge banks of fog swallowing panicked children. That gas was pop up. I also remember a night that was actually kind of magical. I was walking home really late. I'd gone some party, some place I didn't know. It was probably maybe three or 4 a.m. And I was totally sober at this point. And it was so cold, cold like only Michigan and its neighbors gets. Cold enough that the moisture had frozen out of the air. And it makes it so when you breathe, your throat feels raw, it hurts, it's so parching. But it also causes that moisture to freeze into specks of ice that float suspended, glinting in the street lamps. And walking through it feels like walking through a constellation of stars. This particular constellation was in the stadium parking lot, which was empty, except for one parked car. I was enjoying this piece. And then I heard the rattling sound of a poorly maintained bicycle line. I turned and I saw a boy on a bicycle kind of wobble, clearly quite drunk. And I don't believe in a kind of sixth sense, but I knew at a glance exactly what we, he was thinking. Don't hit the car. <laughs> he hit the car. He flew off his bike, skidded a good 10 or 15 feet on that glossy, icy concrete, stunned by himself, struggled to his feet, grabbed his bike, got right back on, started pedaling, built speed, stabilized, wheeled around and hit the car again. <laughs> that night, the boy and the car, I think, were pop on fun. <laughs> As you may have noticed, pop off isn't exactly about having a good time. <laughs> Popov, I think, is about excusing the decisions you're going to make the rest of the night. Decisions predicated on that initial bad decision. Decision to drink poison. Poison that 
doesn't really taste good. And I get it. The real reason you do it is because you're hoping if you get the right dosage that it's gonna correct your overthinking, unlock, you, set things up so that just once your body is going to be able to dance like nature intended, <laughs> clumsy and fearless. But for me, there was no magic dosage. I tried. And, you know, I'm not really surprised. It's kind of the height of the recession. Most of us were in kind of a compromised spot, hadn't lived without our parents. I was confused. But whatever the reason for this vigilance, either I would have too little of this stuff and feel sick and go home early, or more rarely, far too much and forget. There was no night where I was able to forget my worries, live through the experience to enjoy it, and remember what that was like. <laughs> the first time that happened was not on pop-off. It wasn't on anything. A couple of graduates of the engineering school, I was an engineer myself, had come back to visit their friends and watch the game. Now, I didn't relate to these guys. They were kind of rah-rah school spirit types, football fans. But meeting them was really important for me. I was struck by how calm and relaxed, how together they seemed. They had good jobs now. They seemed stable. They seemed like they could afford to be generous with us and with themselves. And for years, they were my sole indication that at the end of this long, dumb ride, some folks made it out, started to build a life they actually wanted to have, a life where you added a little more each day, more than you took away. And I made it out too. And when I got out, I decided I'm not going to drink pop off anymore. <laughs> I don't miss it. I don't drink any of the stuff I drank back in college. And frankly, a lot of it I don't even see down here. I think pop off is maybe a little too rough around the edges for the kind of cocktail bar you usually find in San Francisco. <laughs> Nor do I see the laundry list of Awful piss beers, each with its own special honorific. Natty Light, Natty Ice, or Nice, Milwaukee's Best, The Beast, Bush, Bite, Bush Heavy, Diesel. <laughs> I don't drink any of this stuff, and I don't miss it. But I wonder if my former classmates maybe do. I checked in on those business majors, finance guys. They seem to be doing well. They're still in Michigan, and they run an IT consultancy now. And I wonder, on the weekend, do they go golf? Do they hang out on someone's boat? What do they drink when they do? Whatever it is, it's probably not pop up. <laughs> so with that, hopefully, in all of our rearview mirrors, I'd like to propose a toast to water. <laughs> Vodka's better half. <laughs> they don't age this stuff in barrels, but I find that every year that passes, it tastes a little better to me. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Well, I have to say there's some similarities uh, to my college experience there. <laughs> but anyway, but you know, statute of limitations, we'd say nothing else. Albert Alexander, everybody.
All right. Our final performer tonight is Kimberly Walker in She's Relentless. In this piece, Kimberly shares her newfound love of herself and how the fantasy of a handsome EMT inspired her survival and healing. Please welcome Kimberly Walker. November 13, 2017, 7.45 p.m. I learned that day and every moment after. The first thing I learned is that I am relentless in my pursuit of the D. <laughs> the D, the peen, yep. <laughs> I blame her that pounding pulse between my legs. She's relentless. Let me explain. There I was on the garage floor of my apartment, writhing in pain, gasping for air like a fish out of water. I didn't know what was wrong with me. I didn't know if it was a heart attack or a spider bite. All I knew was I was in pain. Breathing was a chore. And my legs were diminishing, the feeling in my legs were diminishing with every cry for help. I opened my eyes when I heard his voice. It was a fantasy come true. <laughs> Tall, bronze savior, chiseled jaw, pillowy lips, eyes the color of root beer candy. Ma'am, he said as he leaned over me. When did, when did I become a man? <laughs> yes, I said, stretching my eyes and batting my eyelashes. Can you tell me your name and the date? And I told him. And then I asked him what his name was, breathing heavily between each word. He said, Kimberly, can you slow your breathing down? And he said it in the most gentle and sweet way just as my husband would, you know, if he were my husband. <laughs> <laughs> and I said like this, pursing my lips, lifting my chest, attempting to lift my chest. Now the pain was hot. It was, it was like a steel state going through my chest and out my back. And the only thing I had to think of was, is this how our love story begins? He grabbed my wrist and started asking me questions about myself. Best date ever. <laughs> <laughs> I heard him say, heartbeat normal, pulse normal. And I thought, well, not the pulse between my legs. And at that point, it was the only feeling I had left. So I was just gonna let her drive. <laughs> and when we got in the ambulance, I turned the flirting up. He asked me what I ate that day. I told him. And then I asked him what his sign was. <laughs> and he asked me what, how much I weighed. And I didn't tell him. <laughs> <laughs> and I asked him if he believed in fate, if he wanted kids, if he believed in soulmates. And by the time we got to the hospital, he asked me if there was a number he could call somebody just to let him know, let them know that I was doing okay. And I said, well, don't worry about that, but I can give you my number and we can hook up tomorrow. <laughs> and he respectfully declined. <laughs> I also learned later that day that <clears throat> that night that my aorta was swollen and the abscess was pressed against my spine and it cut off the feeling and explained the, the numbness in my legs. And the doctor cautioned me that I have a 20% chance of surviving the surgery. And if I do survive, I'll never walk again. 20% chance of surviving, let's see, I was doing the math in my head, 80% chance of death. Okay, that means I'll never see my family again. Oh, 
well, everybody I love knows I love them. I won't have to do my taxes. <laughs> and I won't have to hear another word about Donald Trump. <laughs> okay, let's do this. And then as the team was wheeling me down toward the operating room, Kenick set in again. And y'all know when Kenick sets in, we all get, what, religious. Oh, and I <laughs> thought, okay, let me, let me recite some Bible verses. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Oh, the rest of that one. Okay, the short one. The short one. Uh, Jesus wept. God is loved. <laughs> Uh, I don't know any more short ones. Okay. <laughs> pray. Pray. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray uh, the Lord my soul to keep if I should die. Uh -uh. <laughs> Hail Mary, son of grace, the Lord. You're not Catholic and you don't even know him. God is good. God is great. Let us be grateful for this food. Uh -huh. <laughs> no, okay. Sing, sing, sing. And suddenly, I heard like Mahalia Jackson, Aretha Franklin. Uh, uh, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch. And as they lifted my body off the gurney and onto the operating table, I once was lost, but now I'm found. They saw the anesthesiologist lower the gas mask over. And as the tears ran down the side of my face, was blind, but now I see, I surrender. Spoiler alert. I woke up upon waking to a spattering of applause from the pastel colored torsos that surrounded my bed. Oh shit, I'm alive, I thought. <laughs> Am I alive? Am I alive? Okay, they're pastel colored and not white. <laughs> I don't think this is hell. Let me see. I did a body scan. Oh, fuck. Could not feel my body from my waist down. And I could just hear the echoing of the surgeon. And you will never walk again. And if you live, you will never walk again. Oh, God. Thank God. I, th I know I surrendered, but I thought we had an agreement. If I were going to live, I would be living with my legs. How, how could you do this? How could you do this to me? How am I going to live without my legs? My legs were your blessing to me. My legs called the boys to the yard. My legs were once described as tall as hope and as strong as desire. I mean, I described them that way. <laughs> But what I'm trying to say is that my legs strutted me in and out of rooms. My legs ran and swam and jumped and kicked and spun and danced with grace. My legs were my calling card. And just as I was having this little pity party about my legs, I heard this nurse say, you are so blessed to be alive. And at that moment, I stopped thinking about my legs and thinking about how much I wish I was dead. It felt like minutes, but I saw my brother's big smile enter the room before he did. 
And then following him was a parade of jovial family and friends. They came armored in their glee and their enthusiasm. They knew that my life hung in the balance and they came to breathe love into my heart and to get me back on my feet. And while they were praying over me and decorating my room with flowers and, and posters of inspirational quotes, what they didn't know is I was cursing God and wishing I was dead. And then when all the fanfare died down, it was just me, me and my thoughts. Those thoughts that I couldn't run from. I call it, I call it um, radical solitude. I couldn't move. There I was, a body in breakdown, hooked up to machines, hardware screwed into my body like Neo from the Matrix. I couldn't dance these thoughts away. I couldn't eat them away. I couldn't drink them away. I try to get lost in fantasy. And just through the life, the fantasy would diminish like the feeling in my body. So masturbation was out of the question. <laughs> How did I get here? I, I, I was a group exercise teacher. I did fitness. I was a fitness guru in my neighborhood in Massachusetts. I could get you all up and teach you the rhythm nation choreography and have you spinning like you think you're Janet Jackson. That is who I am. How did I get here? And you know, when you ask the universe questions, the universal answer and when you can't move and you have no distractions, the answer is in technicolor. Mm -hmm. And there I was, a little girl in front of the TV, coveting the models and the actresses that were being celebrated for being a size zero. I saw little girl Kim, chubby on the playground, being teased for being fat, ostracized, pushed aside by the cute people and I saw little girl Kim seeing the adults in her family laugh and chuckle and tease as she awkwardly walked across the room, making bets on how much she weighed. I spent the better part of my life learning how to hate my body. And what's sadder and more tragic is because I hated my body, I thought of myself as unlovable. See, I covered it, those European, that European idea of beauty. And when I learned how to lose weight, I committed to a regimen of exercise, excessive dieting, excessive exercise, x lax mm -hmm. and diet pills. Mm -hmm. I was committed, the goal was be a size nine, sit down without a belly roll, walk without my legs rubbing, that would make me lovable. That would make me deserving of love. And just like Charles Dickens wrote it himself, I was praying for forgiveness. I didn't do those things because I love my body. I did those things because I hated my body and I wanted to change and here I am, a body without movement. And this is around the time that I learned that we are 99% invisible. The concept or the idea that we are 99% divine consciousness isn't a new concept, but it's one that I now know is true. Didn't happen overnight. It took me some time. I first had to stop feeling sorry for myself and stop feeling like I was being punished. I felt like I was in solitary confinement, floating somewhere between what was and the unknown. But it was when, it was that moment where I was feeling so sorry for myself, where I felt like death 
was the answer. And if I could, I would do anything I could to kill myself was when I knew I was in trouble. And yet again, I surrendered. And I think it was probably about two weeks right before I was uh, discharged, two weeks after that epiphany, the spine surgeon came in and told me that walking was possible. Walking would be possible. My body and my will, if my body and my will were aligned and I followed all the directions of the physical therapist, I would be able to walk again. And I would know this because I would feel spasms kind of in my legs and cramps. And he warned me it would be uncomfortable, but while it was uncomfortable, just know that that was a sign of life. Mm -hmm. And I loved hearing what was possible, but at the same time, I was ready to lean into my new normal and accept me for me. And I was also really getting into that solitude because I got, to, I got seduced by the divine consciousness. And I started a really beautiful love affair with myself. I have some gems that I wanna share with you, but before I do, I wanna tell you that I did see the firefighter two more times. <laughs> the first time I was right after I got out, I figured I'd you know, go to a yoga class, kind of insane person I am. Still <laughs> paralyzed from the waist down. <laughs> yes. And I was sitting in the boutique of the yoga class, kind of staring out while all the women were kind of milling around the boutique. And I was just about to feel sorry for myself when I saw a pride of firefighters walking past the studio, the boutique. And in my mind, they're walking in slow motion. And I caught his eye and he caught mine. And I followed him and he continued to stare at me <laughs> until he just about passed. And then he stopped, took one step back and walked directly into the boutique <laughs> toward me. <laughs> I stopped breathing. And he came and he knelt down and took my hand and said, hello. His voice was baritone with a sweet touch of Southern. You are so beautiful. And I recognized him by the way that the light bounced off of the bronze, bronze flex in his eyes. And I wondered if he recognized me or if this was just a coincidence. And I couldn't speak. I couldn't ask him. And he said some other things, but I stopped listening because you guys, you know those spasms that the doctor was talking about? <laughs> they were happening in my vagina. It was Kegel Fawn in my yoga pants. Best sex ever. <laughs> At that full circle moment, I knew I would walk again. <laughs> I knew I would dance again. <laughs> so here are the four gems. The first is when your back is against the wall, surrender is the way forward. Family, faith. That is, that's the um, love. Love is a medicine that ignites miracles and heals our deepest wounds. Family and faith carry the medicine and gives us every reason to be grateful. So what? I can't strut. I saunter. <laughs> and I can't jump. But I stand grounded. And I can't kick my leg to my ear. But I never could. <laughs> and I'm super flexible. Mm -hmm. that, that makes a difference um and you know the most impactful learning is that my body my body's not a a joke my body's not an apology my body is 99% divine mm -hmm. and 100% miracle mm -hmm. Oh, and the second time I saw the firefighter. 
my friend and I found out where he worked. And I bought him. I bought him a dozen cupcakes. <laughs> and I did this as a gesture of gratitude. And I also wanted to see how far I could take this miracle. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Oh, she's relentless. <laughs> wow, this is why I love Monday Night Monday. I have wonderful stories. Uh, they went away in the evening, but not quite over yet. Um, so we're going to have our three performers sit on stage, and I'm going to go. If you want to just hang tight, okay, I'm going to go grab a couple of stools from back. Hush, not child, and don't cry. Your folks might understand you by and by. Just move on up toward your destination. Though you may find from time to time complications. Not all this kind of stuff. on that for the last couple of years and that's usually really positive although i like to write about food that i feel ambivalent about a lot of convenience store food um and i found that just along the way you know i had a lot of stuff in mind from my collegiate experience where i kind of left a lot of it behind but you know like i'm pretty strong now so revisiting it was challenging actually but i felt like i had room for it yeah there's that wasn't even happening, man, but that's well, the stuff that works. That, that's yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yes, uh, I'll take you in the second moment. Oh, oh yeah. Well, I'm just looking at you. Everybody, you were wonderful. Well, all three of you were wonderful. <laughs> and you look like my friend named Ellen. Just like I thought it was Ellen. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so congratulations on being married. I'm not. It was, it was a fable. Oh, my God. Oh, it's the story. Sorry, this is it was a way to just it wasn't actually just story. All of the story was true. It, like I said, it's a fantasy. It got me off my feet, mm -hmm. onto my feet to, to get and you know, this is I'm manifesting still. So you know, stay tuned. But um no, <laughs> we're not, we didn't. No. <laughs> I and, and by the way, I, I saw him a couple of times and he's just not interested in me, but but you know, that? that's okay. Yeah, he, he gave me some good material. Oh, yeah, you're from the Bay Area. Area. I'm originally from Massachusetts, but um, I've been living here since 20, 2006. Yeah. And you look like my mom. Oh. <laughs> Lisa. Hi, Shane. Hi, Shane. How do you take care of yourself with all the things you go through and all the love you and all the energy you give yourself as part of ID and the challenges you put up with you? Ducky's. <laughs> you probably kill those two as well. Um, 
How do you keep your youth up? What do you do? What a good question. Well, I often have to remind myself to, you know, put my money where my mouth is and do the things that I do for the kids or for other people. Mm -hmm. um, like when I used to do the meditations with the students, I would always just be in kind of facilitation and leader role. And then I realized I can just trust that I can take this moment as well and kind of get into it and, um, you know, do that healing for myself as well. Um, but, you know, it's like, I feel like there's always another layer of that onion, right? Around realizing that the self-care stuff has to be prioritized. You know, it's like, I don't know if you've had that experience where you're just like, oh, again, I'm reminded that I'm not taking care of myself. So I'm better about it. And I would say community, right? Medea Project, she's my, one of my Medea gals. Um, and doing the things that I love. Um, I think the pandemic for me also, like really started me celebrating things that are a little simpler, like walking. I think that was true for a lot of people. Like I walk like a maniac now. Like I walk, 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 walk. And it's so important for my mental health, my emotional health, spiritual health, physical health. So I guess I would say, I hope that I keep staying supple to find new ways to do that, right? So thank you for that reminder. Yeah. Yes. Um, go, go ahead. I'm just gonna ask you. So, um, an experience in college, you have been thinking about my granddaughter. She's 20, she just made 20 last month, and all the things she said, and uh, the choices that you made in your work on parental guidance and more so. And we think of she and other kinds of students. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I, I think one of the main problems with the college system mm -hmm. is that, like, there's this um, article I read about elephants in Africa where for a long time they kind of live in harmony with folks that were living there in you know, little villages but after poaching killed off a lot of the older bulls you got all these young bulls that are running around unchecked and they're like mm -hmm. stampeding and causing these huge problems and it just reminds me of college <laughs> like just having multiple generations in the same place any kind of interplay at all um, I think that I underestimated how much I needed that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's tough when you're also trying to individuate from your folks, okay. right? Because that's an awkward relation. Um, and it's tough to figure out where are some folks who are just maybe five or 10 years down the road that you want to be more like. So that's something I wish that more college students had access to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, my first question is for Kim. So Kim, you went through a life-changing and traumatic experience. Can you share a little bit about what the process was like for putting pen to paper on that experience and sharing it out? Oh, thank you for asking that. Um, it was, cons okay, so when I couldn't write, I remember Ling being in like this, that period where I couldn't write, where I was like, my arms were struck and I was, and I remember thinking, like, I'm going to remember this. I'm going to remember this. And I kept repeating stuff as it happened. Like, there's stuff that y'all don't even know. Like, you know, the vulnerability of somebody putting a catheter in you as a grown woman. That's some mm -hmm. shit right there. So, you know, I kept remembering stuff. And then as I, you know, as, as things started to move forward and I started to recognize myself as this being that was capable of overcoming these things. I really continued to just write about what was coming up for me every, every step of that way. And in telling the story, and I'm gonna tell you, memorizing, remembering the story, I was flirty with the, um, the EMT, but I don't think that he knew I was flirting with him. Like that was what was happening in my head, but I don't think that he, got that that's what I was trying to do. And then as, as time went on, I just felt like I could be, I found, I found the funny in the moments that were crazy, like being paralyzed and trying to go to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. I just, it, was, it was horrific in reality, but I, I found putting pen to paper and talking about the funny in those moments was how I was, how I would get through it spiritually. Thanks for sharing. Thank you for asking. 
Yeah. I also have a question for Lisa. Um, thank you for sharing your story. Um, you sound like a really incredible educator. Thank you. And I've got a lot of friends who are just starting out their career in being educators of different forms. And it sounds like a really intense and difficult and beautiful job. So I'm curious what you have to share and what has kept you going for over 20 years. You know, what a great question. Thank you. Um, I think a couple of things I have realized through teaching is if you don't do the work on yourself, then you can't do anything for the students that you're teaching. And kids, <laughs> this sounds funny, but kids are like dogs and babies, right? Like they, they can tell if you're the real deal, <laughs> you know, like if they can smell it a mile away, which like I was always, I've always been blown away with how corny I can get with my kids, right? Like I like to think I'm pretty damn cool, but I'm also really co corny, right? Um, I mean, even just the fact of calling teenagers duckies, you know, and if I don't, they, they remind me that I, that I need to, but um, I think it's kind of similar to um, how I answered Shay's question, which is just always trying to stay supple and open to the things that are going to inspire me. And some of it will stick and some of it will suck, but the stuff that sticks, it's magic. Like, at the same time that I started calling the kids duckies, I started a call and response ritual at the end of every class. And I've done that for 20 years too, where I say at the end of the class, it's an honor and a privilege to teach you. And they say, it's an honor and a privilege to learn. Mm -hmm. And that's how we close it out every day. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes it's like we're running and rushing and it's not as meaningful as, as it could be. But I feel like that, you know, that grounding kind of stuff really helps. Um, yeah like doing my own work and knowing who I am also means that I can apologize to a class. And that doesn't mean that I don't have classroom management, right? Like classroom management means everyone's just running rough, rough shot all, all over everything. But if you are grounded in who you are, the places you can go with them is kind of amazing, you know? And I also tell them all the time how much I love my job, you know? Um, because I feel like it's important for them to hear that, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. Thank you for that question. And I think if your girlfriends are interested in something on the line or even all of you, she go to one of her shows and she give for her children, her kiddos, her kids. <laughs> and like, I went to her performance of the children in high school, junior high school student. And every performance they did, maybe about 12 different dances, and nothing was the same. Intermission, came out. Nothing movement was the same, but it was riveting and ongoing. Kids were just professional looking for real authors who talk to them. You have some other so questions? Do you, uh, oh, sorry. I know you enjoy uh, performing because it's what you're doing, but do you go other places other than just here to now or you? This is Kim? Yes. Me? This is my first, I'm a virgin. Oh, not me. <laughs> 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 natural darling. <laughs> Thank you. I was wondering if this was for all of you, if this is the piece or if this is just a part of the piece. Okay. I have a vision. Of a, of a show, of a one woman show mm -hmm. that goes beyond this piece. It starts with something and it ends with something else. Maybe like a real marriage. No, but, but you know, <laughs> she's going to let the point, it's a voice. No, but, but like it just, it, it expounds because my, my journey from 2006 to this very moment has been super epic. And I, I have many pockets of stories around this journey. And I, the more I get myself out here, and this is why I'm here, because the more I get myself out here, to tell the story and to 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 really be in the story, um, there's like I want the story to be impactful. I want the story to mean something, um, and um, it's it's been super cathartic because the journey has been edifying for sure, but it hasn't been easy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you.
are all uh, are all three of you previously performed? I know Kim, this is your first time performing. Mm -hmm. yes. The other two have you yes. also performed. Yeah. Yes. You have, and you write about books, or or you get on stage and talk about food and. Yeah, so I mean, um, I mean, there's the first question. I've got like 25 or 30 essays that are about eating. Yeah. Um, and uh, I've got them on my blog and I also send them out to journals and I'm still feeling out what's the best way to share, you know? And so like, this is my first time doing extended kind of, not a read, but a retelling. And um, I've done a couple as like kind of pilot for podcasts, done some little immersive stuff. So I'm still kind of experimenting with that. But I have, um, I, I played music for a really long time. Um, got used to performing that way. And I also host these underground surrealist dinners. Um, so I've been doing some, uh, some odd kind of interactive food experiences, um, which sometimes have a lot of words and sometimes don't have any. Uh, just this spring, we had Lettuce Fest, which is a, a lot of fun, kind of cultural celebration of lettuce. Did you say let us pray at the radio beginning? Yeah. Yeah. Grace. Someone did. Yes, I just, um, my first one woman show was called Gratitude. It was directed by Rodessa Jones. I just did it at the San Francisco International Arts Festival. Okay. Um, and this is the very beginning of this piece. So I, I do envision this being a full length show. It's really interesting about this piece because I kept feeling like it was a piece about being a teacher. And then this whole other part about me as a middle school student and as a kid just like demanded to be given airtime. And so that took it in a whole other different direction because all that shit's very vulnerable, of course. And, um, but it feels like a really good kind of, you know, pairing. Um, so yeah, the hope is to, to keep creating. This is a nice chunk of time. Like 20 minutes is longer than 10. Like 10 always feels like too short. Like whenever I've done 10 minute spots, I always feel like it's over. Um, and 20 is a nice chunk, so. And I'm also, I just have to say like, this is a great trio. Like, I feel like I really feel blessed that we all got to perform tonight because you're the badass. And, uh, but she yeah. did say that the 90 minutes she did with the one on the show. <laughs> she is my hype woman. <laughs> I love you, Shane. You're the best. She is a performer, also. We both perform in the Medea Project. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. I do have one question, and this may or may not have an answer, and this is for all of you. Um, as someone who writes nonfiction, I would be horrified sharing a lot of the things that I write. And so I'm wondering how you find like the boundary of what you will share vulnerably mm -hmm. and what you won't about yourself and about others who are in your stories. I have no boundaries. <laughs> no boundaries. <laughs> That's the truth. <laughs> no, I and also this is like I, I, he thank, thanks for, to Albert. He he I call it, I was calling it fantasy nonfiction. And he was like, isn't that like a fable? And I was like, oh yeah. So I, I weaving truth in elaboration and kind of makes fictionalizing. it fictionalizing it makes it a little bit easier to mm -hmm. talk about some of those really, really vulnerable moments. And, and they're very real. The tears, I got a little quivery up here and it, it's real stuff yeah. because I'm going, I'm in my body to tell the story. And um it shows up and it's true. I have no boundaries. I will talk about myself, about anything about myself. Just I think for me, just, it's I won't tell you how much I weigh. Go ahead. <laughs> I think for me, um, and because I've been a member of the Medea Project for so many years, um, and you know, the motto really is storytelling as life saving and revolution. Mm -hmm. And like doing all of that work in community and seeing the powerful connection and kind of liberation people can have from, all of us can have from telling our story. I think it just kind of created a, um, and anything can be told, you know, like, I'm not sure I'm articulating it so well, but um, 
if you tell your story, somebody else feels like they have permission to tell theirs. And that's what we would see with the Medea Project when we would, I'm not sure if everybody's familiar, it's Theater for Incarcerated Women, mm -hmm. uh, directed by Rodessa Jones. And um, we would go into the jails and sometimes personnel in the jails would say, how do you get women to tell their stories? And it's like, you don't get anyone to tell their stories, you tell your own. Mm -hmm. And then somebody else feels like they can, they'll, they'll tell their stories. That said, I think it's good to keep that self-care component in there though, you know, like it's so that you don't feel like you're um, damaging yourself, you know, it's sometimes it's timing, right? Like there are stories that I'm comfortable telling now that I wouldn't have been comfortable telling 10 years ago. I'm not, I'm not that person anymore, you know? Um, so I think it's always good to do that kind of, you know, check in with the self. And, and for me, I feel like, and this seems true for, for, uh, almost every solo performer that I know it's like you kind of find the recipe for raw and funny right you know like you, you don't want to leave the audience in this place where they're it's just dismal right, right? because then everyone slumps out of the yeah. theater like this right yeah. uh -huh. and I think as artists you know we're hope warriors in a lot of ways right like that's kind of our jam so that balance kind of, I don't know, it works, I think, you know, and I can feel it in myself. Like if I feel like, okay, I need a little reprieve, like this part is feeling a little too much, you know, mm -hmm. um, then, you know, try to find some, some levity, but it's a good question to always ask, you know, like, cause you're in service to yourself and not just mm -hmm. your audience, right? So. I've got a really different answer. <laughs> um, almost everything I write isn't about me. Mm -hmm. Um, and I find that there's a lot of um, encouragement and a lot of context saying, just say what's in you. And I think that is a great thing to do. It's not what I do. Mm -hmm. I sometimes get there, and this is about as personal as the story gets for me. Mm -hmm. But like, I just wrote a thing on corn. I actually don't really care about corn. You know, <laughs> it turns out it's really interesting all on its own. Um, and so, <laughs> trust me. <laughs> Um, and, you know, having your own perspective and trusting your perspective, that's where the magic mm -hmm. is more than yes. material. Mm -hmm. And some I'll tack on to that. This is actually something that weirdly I, I learned from, I took a career shift where I started cold calling. Um, I was an engineer, but I took a job cold calling cold callers to sell cold calling software. So I thought that was funny. Um, and, and it was, but I also got a lot of migraines. Um, but Something I learned hanging out with salespeople that ended up affecting me a lot as an artist is the thing that makes you uncomfortable isn't what makes someone else uncomfortable. They're just not related. Other people get uncomfortable because you're uncomfortable. That's the part that's making them uncomfortable. It's not the fact that the particular thing is like terrifying to them or it's going to be really fragile and difficult. And just, I think I really underestimated how much pre writing. I need to do just for me. And that sometimes you need to do that five or 10 pages of context that's actually not for the rest of the world. That's mm -hmm. just helping you reformulate and get to a spot where you can sit. And then you find the part that's going to tell the story that serves the story's audience. Mm -hmm. um, you have to do both, I think, if you're really going to make polished work. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there's a lot of really beautiful stuff that's extemporaneous, straight from the heart and raw. But I just have a special place in my heart for people that put a lot of ball on. Mm -hmm. I do love this voice. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 so good. You could read the phone book. Yeah, I'll read the phone book. I'll read the phone book. Yeah, I don't want the phone book. <laughs> <laughs> it's the thing your phone comes in, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is the instruction. <laughs> Before we wrap up, do we have any final questions? So any of you performing uh, here any other time? Next month, the 28th. Uh, yeah. Can I just ask the broad, that's the perfect thing to ask. And I'm just going to broaden that a little bit. What, what are you doing here or elsewhere? And how can we, we want to find out more about your work? What's the best way to, to find you? Oh, well, I'll be here next week. Two weeks. Oh, oh, the two weeks. The twenty eighth. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Oh, two weeks. Okay. I'll be at twenty. I think we all are. Point. Yeah. Yeah. We we're the same crew. Okay. Mm -hmm. They have to go to crew. Mm -hmm. Just about that, you know. Yeah.
Websites. I'm on Lisa, I'm Lisa A. Frias on Instagram and on Facebook. My website is being revamped at the moment. Um, I'm working on this piece right now. So I'm going to keep my nose to the grindstone and keep working on this and make it happen. Will it be different than all of you on the 28th? Or no, same piece. Same? Yeah. Right. We could do each other's pieces. Oh, oh. <laughs> that would go really well. Yeah, we do it perfectly. <laughs> yeah. It's like it needs to come from you. I don't know. I don't know. Yes. No, so I'm just going to ask you if there are uh, a website, oh, Instagram, Instagram, Instagram. Oh, geez. Yeah. I'm going to know. I'm, okay. At Karma Yoga Tribe on Instagram and I'm Kimberly Walker on Facebook. But I guess I'll start working on something now that I'm, you know, I guess I need to do that. Yeah. Um, I'll talk to my young friends. Yeah. <laughs> I got a few things. Uh, all my writings at albertalexander.art. Um, there's sign up there, but really you should get on my mailing list directly. I'll, I'll take folks' emails. Like, like I do events and stuff. Um, and so I, I've got kind of a newsletter for that. For these like weird RC food things mostly. And then the other thing is uh, my house is sponsoring a writing prize right now. Um, and the theme is fruit. I'm looking for pros on fruit, 1500 words or less, 250 bucks. So, um, if you're interested in participating, let me know and I'll send you the link. So, you said your house? Or That's right. What's that mean? Literally, the place I live. Oh, yeah. Like, <laughs> uh, I live with some artsy people, and uh, I said, Hey, what if we did a prize? And they're like, Sure, whatever you want to do, I guess. And you know, <laughs> Right. So I just got excited about prizes. You know, like there's, it seems like a cool way to meet writers and give them a prize, right? So, I love it. Yeah. How do we get on your list? Um, I'll, I'll just take your email. Yeah. And I'll add you right on. I have to tell you, I am starting a podcast. It's called Gem Tales. And I completely forgot. And we're in the process of It's called Gem Tales. And it's stories where we, stories that bring people to um, a point of, finding the, the gems and, and some hardships mm -hmm. in their life. So uh, my partner and I, Drea, are, um, will be launching that soon. So that's, so look for that as well. The Medea Project will have some shows coming up soon too, so you can check us out as well. Yeah. You all were an amazing audience too, I have to say. I know. Yeah, you you must, yeah, yeah. So such a little I'm going to thank first, let's thank the performers again. I want to thank the audience. You know, um, Zoom is great. And if there's anybody watching on Zoom, thank you, thank you. But there's nothing like, and I'll, I'll say it till I die there isn't theater, is not theater without people in seats yes. and without this sort of exchange yeah, yeah. energy back and forth. Yeah. So, audience, thank you for coming out yeah. on Monday night. Um, and making the performances better just simply by being. Yes. Yeah. And thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank 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 you.